Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fourth session of Tax Foundation University. We're going to wait just a minute or two for folks to hop on. We have a jam-packed session today uh, with lots of various tax applications to chat through, so we're, we are excited. So we'll get started here in about 60 seconds. Well, once again, welcome everyone to our fourth session of Tax Foundation University. Today we'll be discussing various applications for tax policy and various options for tax policy changes in the context of a variety of, uh, of important topics in federal policy, ranging from infrastructure to manufacturing, climate change, and child po poverty, amongst other topics. And uh, it's a very exciting last couple of weeks here uh, for the federal team at the Tax Foundation because uh, we had the pleasure of releasing our recent uh, options for reforming America's tax code 2.0, the second edition of a book that reviews many of the different options available to policymakers to change federal tax policy. Uh, and my colleague Erica here will be going through some of the, uh, the ways in which this book will be helpful for thinking about tax policy. Uh, and that'll help set the stage for a lot of our, our discussion today. Uh, and uh, with us, uh, of course, in addition to, to Erica and I, uh, joining us will be our colleague, Alex uh, Marijano, uh, who will be talking about uh, a variety of applications in, in tax policy related to uh, manufacturing and, uh, and expensing uh, related provisions, which have more applications than you may uh, initial, initially think when we get into it. So we're very excited. So we have a very uh, busy agenda today talking about how we can apply tax policy in this year and beyond. Uh, in addition to the topics that you see here on the screen, we are also uh, very much open in the next and final session of TFU to uh, consider the uh, topics that you are interested in. Uh, spend, you spend a lot of time, of course, going through the, the basics and mechanics of federal policy, and we are excited to get your feedback on what areas we should be focusing on. So there's two ways to do that. I think as we go through this session, feel free to use uh, the, the comment or Q&A feature to, if it's uh, something you want to see in the next session, that will be very helpful for us as we think about planning for that session. Uh, or feel free to uh, give a, contact us through email uh, on suggestions. Uh, in addition to those suggestions, we'll likely be covering a lot of the uh, proposals that are now going around Washington, of course, uh, over the past uh, month that we've been engaging on pretty heavily, but uh, we really do want to make that an interactive session. So feel free to let us know uh, as we go through a lot of the uh, applications today. So with all that in mind, uh, I want to turn uh, the, uh, the agenda over to my colleague Erica to chat about uh, our options guide, the, uh, how you think you can think about it, its application, and then we'll dive into the specific application areas. Thanks, Garrett. So as Garrett said, we were super excited to um, release our, our new options guide online. It contains modeling and explanations for 70 different tax policies. The way we approach the options guide in, in this edition is to um, break policies out into four areas to, to meet the challenges that, that are facing lawmakers um, today. So the first chapter in the book is options to promote economic growth. The second chapter in the book is options to reduce the deficit. The third chapter in the book is options to protect the vulnerable. And these are options that are primarily aimed at increasing the after-tax income of, of lower and middle income taxpayers. And then the fourth chapter is on ways to simplify the tax code because that's, that's an ever-present need um, in, in tax policy as, as you've seen over the last few weeks. So the the theme of the book, we're, we're, we're modeling 70 different tax policies. So there's just a collection of a lot of different things going on. But throughout those 70 things, um, there, there are a few themes that emerge. And one of the biggest is that in tax policy, there are ever present trade offs between the economic impact of a tax, the revenue that will be raised by a tax, and who bears the burden of that. So if you want to um, increase revenue and increase the progressivity of the tax code, you might have to trade off some economic growth to do that. 
or if you want to boost economic growth, you might have to trade off some revenue or trade off some progressivity. So there's always um, there's always things to think about in terms of the effects of, of tax policy on people, on um, the economy, and on on revenues. And so that's what the the book tries to illustrate by showing the economic effects, the conventional and and dynamic um, revenue of a tax change, and how it changes the distribution of the tax burden on on people's after tax incomes. So today we're going to be presenting several of those options. You can find the entire um, book online on our website, and there's also an interactive element. So you can toggle through different things like um, raising the corporate tax rate to 28% or 25%. Um, so it's, it's very user-friendly in, in our new format online, and we hope that it's um, helpful as you're thinking about all of the, the tax policy applications this year and um, in years to come. So with that, we can dive in and, and look at some of these options and um, the, the categories they're related to, like infrastructure and, and manufacturing. Thanks, Erica. Yeah, we can go ahead and, and kick it off. And we, and we tried to, to pick, select these topics, of course, for their salience in the federal policy debate, particularly this year with the new administration uh, and a, um, an ambitious agenda. So we um, basically what we're going to do here in this session is go through some of the context surrounding the various issues related to tax and, and the given area we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll also subsequently present a couple of different tax options to consider and the various trade-offs that Erica was talking about as it relates to revenue, uh, the economic uh, growth after tax incomes and the distribution of that, of that tax burden. So to kick it off, uh, I'll, I'll get started here with a discussion about how uh, taxes and infrastructure uh, relate to one another. A very interesting topic in that, of course, it has both a state and a federal uh, component uh, to our current financing of infrastructure, notably, of course, highways and roads and, and ports and bridges are the, are the first things you tend to think about when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, and our system is interesting in that we have strong federal support through the Highway Trust Fund that's allocated to states for highways, of course, the federal government often directly maintains uh, federal highways that were established in the mid 20th century. Uh, and then states also play, of course, their own separate important role when it comes to local and state uh, infrastructure financing. Uh, and and a, a big part of the, uh, the, the way in which the financing is designed, uh, especially at the state level, of course, uh, and as well as at the federal level in the form of the gas tax is often the revenue sources for roads and highways are connected to uh, the uh, the individuals or users of those of of those uh, of that infrastructure, right? So you think about both uh, the gas tax, which is levied at the uh, state level and the federal level, as well as private user fees that can be uh, levied in the form of tolls or other charges. Uh, those are offer, often connected to the usage of those roads, right? A very straightforward example is uh, the more you drive on a road, the more gas you may need. The more gas you need, right? The more gas tax you're paying. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that it's not always directly a one-for-one -one connection. Uh, there's a correlation, but not a direct connection. A very straightforward example of that, of course, are, are farmers who may use diesel or gas-powered machinery on their own land and not necessarily on federal or state infrastructure. Uh, so there are exceptions, of course, to this user pays principle, but that is something that has connected the financing sources for federal and state infrastructure with uh, the users uh, who are uh, paying for them. And uh, these taxes do have uh, a long history in the US. Of course, states have levied uh, various uh, motor fuel taxes since 1919. Uh, as you can see on the, the map here on the right, uh, 48 states in, in the District of Columbia uh, continue to collect taxes on, on motor fuel, uh, as well as, of course, a variety of other rules related to fuel economy uh, to help uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and there's been an ongoing debate about, of course, what the correct level of uh, the gas tax is both in the states and at the federal level because that tax historically has not been uh, indexed for inflation. And what that means is the real value of the gas tax has uh, been eroded over time. Uh, to give you a, a sense of that in, uh, to, to give you a sense of what it'll look like moving forward in 2019, uh, the gas tax uh, projected revenue at the federal and state level uh, was something close to $60 billion nominally. Uh, if you look at what it'll be projected in 2050 or so, uh, in nominal terms, it, it'll be actually be going down closer to 50 billion because of the switch from uh, gas power vehicles to electric vehicles. But in real terms, because that tax is not indexed for inflation, you're actually looking at revenue south of 
$30 billion, a 50% erosion in the value of the gas tax revenue over time. And so that, that is going to place pressure for uh, thinking about alternative uh, financing options for infrastructure, just maintaining our existing infrastructure, as they say nothing of additional financing methods that we'll talk about uh, here in a minute. Uh, and so there, there are opportunities to think about how we sustainably fund infrastructure and the Highway Trust Fund. Of course, there have been some bipartisan efforts over the past few years to do so, notably the FAST Act, which was the uh, surface transportation bill that passed in 2015 on a bipartisan basis, uh, funded purely through uh, private user fees, notably, and not through an increase in the gas tax. But that may give us some ideas as to what a bipartisan infrastructure proposal may look like. Uh, and of course, it'd be remiss, and, and it goes without saying that there are alternative ways in which we could fund infrastructure, notably, of course, the president and members of Congress are looking at uh, increasing taxes elsewhere, uh, including raising taxes on uh, corporations uh, to fund uh, not just maintenance of existing infrastructure, but a build out of, uh, of not new infrastructure uh, or going back and working on deferred maintenance uh, needs across the nation. Uh, and of course, there is also a discussion about what constitutes infrastructure, right? There is, uh, as we've gone through the beginning of the 21st century, a discussion that, hey, something like broadband is just as important for a lot of communities, particularly communities who are struggling to keep up with broadband access as uh, other forms of infrastructure may, uh, may be or have been in the past. And so we should consider that in the context of a, a modernized infrastructure system. Uh, same goes for other uh, access to other uh, technology that may not uh, be available elsewhere like 5G. And so that'll of course be continuing to continue to be part of the conversation as we think about these, these financing sources. And lastly, uh, as you can see on the map, it's uh, the portion of uh, road spending alone that's funded by user taxes in each state really does vary, uh, going from almost 100% in California, 100% exactly in, in Montana and Tennessee, all the way down to less than, um, less than 30% in, in a place like North Dakota. Uh, and a lot of this uh, is based on the way in which states emphasize their own gas taxes, uh, the alternative revenue sources that they may use, for example, in Arkansas, which less than half of their state financing uh, comes from, uh, from user taxes for their roads. Often they may rely on sales taxes or other forms of taxation at the state level to finance it. So um, there's not even really agreement at the state level on how to do this in, in terms of design uh, over time. So with all that, that context in mind, I uh, wanted to turn to a couple of options that we've modeled uh, for, uh, for changing the gas tax at the federal level. Uh, and so uh, both of these options here would increase the gas tax. Uh, the, the, the left option would increase it by 15 cents and adjust it for inflation. As I, I note, uh, noted, it's currently uh, in nominal terms, uh, not just staying the same, but actually decreasing uh, because the, the, the amount collected is decreasing because uh, the amount of people driving uh, gasoline power vehicles is going down uh, over time. Uh, this would increase both the, uh, the amount that is being collected uh, per gallon of gas and in, in inflation adjusted. And so as you can see, both of these options do reduce uh, long run economic growth that is similar to other consumption taxes. Uh, going back to what we talked about in the previous few sessions, uh, it, it, it would have uh, a positive revenue effect going from 330 billion conventionally over 10 years, if we increase it by 15 cents, closer to 750 billion, if we collect, uh, if we increase it by 35, 35 cents and in inflation adjust it. So uh, this is, these are two options that would, would raise revenue, would have a negative economic impact, though not as large as other options we may talk about uh, moving forward. You may see the contrast there when we get to them. Uh, and then you can see on the bottom here, this is the distribution of the tax burden. So this is in the percent change in after-tax income. So when we increase the tax for say the bottom 20% of, of filers, their adjusted gross income is reduced by about 0.2% uh, in after-tax terms. Uh, and, and you'll notice for the most part, uh, this tax uh, would be roughly proportionate across the income spectrum uh, as a portion of folks' incomes. Though for the, uh, the, the bigger tax change here, that would have a slightly larger effect on the bottom 20% than others. So that is something to consider, a good example of the trade-offs involved when thinking about financing for, uh, for infrastructure. Uh, and then the other proposal I had mentioned before we turn, turn it over to, uh, to Alex to talk about manufacturing is uh, the proposal to tax vehicle miles traveled. And that would resolve the, the problem that I mentioned of having uh, an eroding uh, tax base because people are not driving as many gasoline powered vehicles because of electric vehicles, right? 
the vehicle miles travel tax would levy a tax on all vehicles that are traveling on the basis of how much they're using the road directly. So it's a much more, if you can get it working, and that's a big if, it's actually a much more efficient way to connect the use of the infrastructure with uh, the amount that is being paid for it. The challenge is, of course, uh, creating a system that would effectively measure uh, those vehicle miles traveled without uh, running into problems related to privacy, of course, because the government would have to have some way of getting to that, uh, while also minimizing avoidance or evasion behavior that folks may be incentivized to, uh, to take advantage of. Uh, and so a lot will have to be resolved in terms of these questions before this this got off the ground, but that is something else that's been talked about at the state and federal levels. If it did end up happening, I suspect it would be the result of many successive successful experiments, particularly at the local and state levels uh, to get this working. Uh, it's unlikely without a, a good pilot to show how this would work in practice, if even possible, uh, that it would be taken up nationally. But it is something to watch for, especially as we see electric vehicles gain ground against uh, gasoline power vehicles over the next couple of decades. So with all that in mind, I, I do want to turn it, uh, it over to uh, to my colleague Alex, uh, who's done some really interesting work on uh, taxes and manufacturing, and specifically how uh, full cost recovery and other tax changes could help us improve our, our manufacturing capacity. Hello, does that work? Yep, we my can hear you. Gary to my level. All right, good. Uh, hello, I'm Alex Morishano. I don't know if uh, I, I presume I was introduced before. I had some a little bit of trouble uh, getting on, but uh, we're here now. That's what matters. Uh, I am a federal analyst uh, analyst on the federal team, uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, sort of how different tax policies can indirectly or directly um, favor a certain uh, uh, favor or disfavor manufacturing, rather. Um, now, in previous sessions, I'm sure you guys have covered the ideas uh, about cost recovery for investments that uh, ideally um, for growth purposes, we should be allowing uh, full expensing for capital investment, uh, allowing companies to deduct what they spend on stuff like machinery, equipment, structures, uh, when they make them, um, which because of inflation and the time value of money, uh, having to spread them out over a long period of time means they don't recover the full cost. Um, and there are some very important implications of this sector by sector, um, because companies that rely heavily on those types of costs um, suffer more when we have to spread those types of costs out than industries that do not rely as heavily on physical investment. Um, the best answer here, or best sort of politically salient answer or example here is, is manufacturing. Manufacturing is a very capital intensive industry. You know, if you want to think of, of, of factories for semiconductors or, or steel plants or stuff like that, um, that requires a lot of big upfront investment. Um, and so one example here um, is in the 1986 tax reform, there were some major changes to uh, depreciation, uh, particularly for structures. Um, structures in the 1981 tax cuts, uh, depreciation schedules were reduced to 15 years for uh, both residential and commercial structures, and then they were extended um, they were extended incrementally by some smaller chain reform bills in between, but the Tax Reform Act of 1986 increased the cost recovery for structures from 15 year, from 19 years by then to 31, um, 31 for commercial and 27.5 years for residential. And what that does is that it increases uh, the costs or, or reduces the share of costs uh, companies can can realistically deduct can can deduct, um, and that creates a bias in the tax code in favor of say, um, you know, a retail business or 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 think about think about you know places in the mall tend to be sort of a less capital intensive than a factory, uh, and so if policymakers are thinking about ways to help manufacturing specifically as an industry, it, it, instead of creating sort of separate new programs, sort of separate tax credits or, 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 or a subsidy program of some kind 
designed sort of specifically to target manufacturing to create sort of a positive bias in favor of manufacturing. Um, that doesn't make as much sense as actually just eliminating this sort of current bias against those types of businesses that is currently in the code, um, which is uh, what spreading costs out over a long period of time is. Um, yeah, and so this is a sort of a major policy concern about, uh, there are a lot of aspects to this concerns about declining productivity growth, um, which have sort of better treatment for capital investment would help. Um, concerns about uh, uh, declining manufacturing. I mean, that has been a, a major theme of, of American politics for a while, um, that there's some, there's some evidence of times when we activated sort of temporary versions of, of expensing for stuff like uh, 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 machinery and, and equipment that have escalated productivity and wages. Um, and we should be thinking about that uh, as, as an issue. And uh, as you see, I, I, the, the chart there about the, the US's capital stock is just sort of, it's become a lot older over time on average. And, and that has a lot of implications for, for productivity. And, um, and so increasing sort of the capital investment uh, would, would really help um, uh, the manufacturing industry in particular, even though it is not a policy that is per se biased against uh, uh, or biased for manufacturing, it is just simply eliminating a policy that is a bias against it. Um, so I guess I'll move over to talk about the, the options. Um, yeah, and so um, full expensing for capital investments, which would allow uh, all sorts of, of, of uh, capital projects to be deducted immediately, uh, would have a very powerful impact on economic growth because it is is a targeted tax cut uh, for invest for new investment essentially. So when you're doing say reducing the corporate income tax rate, there's you're reducing the tax on returns to future investment, which is uh, um, you know which that stimulates investment because because companies are likely to retain on more of what they'll earn from from something, but. Uh, uh, you're also cutting taxes for returns to old investment and those decisions are already made. Um, so that has a less powerful economic effect, but with full expensing where you're letting companies recover the full cost of investments going forward, that is only a tax cut for uh, a new investment, um, which is, uh, so as a result, it's sort of a more powerful policy for the amount of revenue you're giving up. So, uh, as you can see, it would have sort of a very powerful impact on, on growth wages, um, thanks to sort of investments means uh, uh, more productivity and productivity is in the long run, the main driver of economic growth and wage growth. So that's full expensing uh, and it would help uh, uh, manufacturing in particular because these, those are the companies that rely most heavily on the kind of costs um, that full expensing would treat properly. Um, there's also the um, uh, sort of repealing a lot of tariffs. Um, there's an idea that tariffs are, are what will protect American industry, American manufacturing, um, but there's actually a, a problem there where uh, tariffs on input goods um, that are used by manufacturing firms end up having the opposite result. Um, there's a famous example uh, from the 2000s about George W. Bush's steel tariffs that uh, uh, they actually ended up costing a lot more jobs than they saved because, as you might guess, a lot of industries, particularly heavy industries, use steel. Um, and so eliminating these types of tariffs would reduce costs for domestic manufacturers in other sectors that use these types of goods. So um, that is the, the story on how to, to improve uh, the tax code to help manufacturing in a way that does not depart from neutral tax principles. Uh, I guess I'll pass it over to, I'm not sure who is next, if it's Garrett or, or Erica. Yeah, I think it's uh, Erica uh, to chat about uh, poverty, a uh, really salient topic right now. Take it away. All right, so um, I think we can, yep, yep there we go. Um, two, two of our largest uh, poverty alleviation programs are, are actually administered through the tax code, and that would be the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. 
And while it sounds like one just deals with children and the other just deals with work, both of them actually vary with both factors. So prior to the American Rescue Plan, um, the child tax credit phased in with earned income at a 15% rate. And so what that means is that for each dollar of additional income earned in the phase in range, it would receive a matching 15 cents of tax credit. So implicitly that reduces the marginal tax rate that people face along the phase in and it encourages work um, by, um, by reducing that, that marginal tax rate and meaning each additional dollar of income gets matched with additional tax credit. And so if you'll remember back to, to um, the first week when we talked about the ways that the taxes affect um, people's behavior, there, there are really two effects that we can think of. One is an income effect. And the income effect says that if households or businesses have more income, they will engage in more economically productive activities or less economically productive activities. Um, or there's the substitution effect. And that's what neoclassical theory, that's what our tax modeling is, is based on. If you make work cheaper relative to leisure, households will work more. If you make investment cheaper relative to consumption, businesses will invest more. And so when you have um, a, a phase in like in, the, like in the child tax credit, you're making work cheaper relative to leisure by increasing the return to work along that phase in line. So if we have a policy change that, that takes out that phase in, which is what the, the child tax credit expansion in the um, American Rescue Plan did, it made the child tax credit fully refundable and uh, eliminated the phase in, um, that has the effect of increasing marginal tax rates along that old phase in. And that's illustrated in the chart here on, on the right hand side. Um, those, the, these marginal tax rates charts can be kind of hard to look at but what it's showing is the income level of a person along the bottom, the, the tax rates, um, the marginal tax rates along the side, and the, the darker blue line is showing that along some income areas, um, marginal tax rates are higher under the new child tax credit than they were under prior law. And that's because that phase in has been eliminated. And so it actually has the effect of increasing marginal tax rates. But on the left-hand side of the chart, we can see that the trade-off for those higher marginal tax rates is a larger dollar amount of the child tax credit going to, to those households um, that have lower incomes. So at the same time that a tax change is leading to higher marginal tax rates and um, disincentivizing labor along, along those income levels and affecting the, the return to labor, it's also providing a larger average benefit. That can sometimes be weird to, to think about, um, but, but these are the effects that, that um, phase-ins and, and phase-outs can have. And so the, the other major poverty alleviation program, um, in addition to the child tax credit, is the earned income tax credit. And that's a refundable tax credit targeted at low-income workers. The majority of benefits of, of the EITC accrue to people with adjusted gross incomes under $30,000, about one-third of the benefits accrue to people with AGI under $15,000. Um, so it is very well targeted to low income households. The, the shape of it looks similar to the shape here of the half pink and then half blue child tax credit on that left-hand chart. The EITC um, has a phase in. So for each additional dollar of income earned, a person receives a matching credit and that lowers the worker's um, implicit marginal tax rate along that phase in. Then it plateaus, so um, additional dollars of income earned don't have any effect on, on the credit size or um, the, the implicit marginal tax rate because the credit just stays constant. And then there's a phase out where extra income reduces the size of the credit and that raises implicit marginal tax rates. The child tax credit also has a phase out that, that increases um, implicit marginal tax rates as the CTC reduces. So like I said, the, the EITC is well targeted towards low income workers. Um, it reduces poverty and it counteracts regressivity from, from other areas of the tax code. Research shows that the earned income tax credit um, encourages work participation among certain groups, specifically um, among single mothers. But the research also indicates that it, it doesn't have a clear effect on the number of hours worked. So it, it is able to pull people into the workforce, but it does not necessarily lead to people um, increasing the number of hours they work. 
while the EITC has um, many strengths, it also has many weaknesses. It's super complicated um, and uh, in large part due to, to the complicated eligibility rules, it has a consistently high error rate. It can create negative economic incentives for workers. Um, it, it can penalize workers for marrying and it creates a disparity between workers with and without qualifying children. So we can go to the next page, the next slide. Um, in our options guide, we've modeled several um, changes to the EITC, the, CI, the CTC, and other tax policies that would affect lower and middle income households. Um, two of them here that I'll highlight are restructuring the CTC and EITC, and that's based on Senator Mitt Romney's proposal. And then we'll also talk about increasing um, the standard deduction. So under option 55 that's shown here, um, it would, it would increase the amount of the child tax benefit and it would make that um, child tax credit fully refundable. So no minimum income requirement and no phase in. And so that would um, increase implicit marginal tax rates along, along that like we just saw. It would also reform the EITC to restructure it and, and remove some of the differences between um, married and unmarried filers and filers with and without qualifying children, as well as change some of the phase in and phase out. And so what, what we've found in modeling this is that um, this option would slightly increase economic output overall, mainly due to the changes of those phase ins and phase outs and how they alter marginal tax rates on labor. Some people would experience higher marginal tax rates, others would experience lower marginal tax rates and, and the the net effect of that is a slightly larger, um, slightly larger economic output. As you can see in the bottom table, um, it would significantly expand benefits across all income quintiles, but with the largest increases going to the bottom income quintiles. And it would also be very expensive. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the CTC and EITC are two of the largest poverty alleviation programs already. And under this plan, we estimate that those would be expanded by about $1.4 trillion over 10 years. So very significant um, change and expansion in, in benefits. Another thing that, that we could think about um, when we're thinking about how the, the tax code affects low and middle income taxpayers is looking at the standard deduction. You can kind of think of the standard deduction as the 0% tax bracket. So um, under current law, the, the standard deduction for married filers is around $24,000. For single filers, it's around $12,000. So your first $12,000 or $24,000 if you're married of income goes um, untaxed because you get to deduct it when calculating your taxable income. So if we increase the standard deduction in current law by 25% across the board for, for all filing statuses, what would that look like? Well, taxpayers in the bottom quintile would only see a very small benefit because most there already have little taxable income after the current standard deduction. So expanding it wouldn't provide much of a benefit to them. Um, the big benefits of expanding it would go to middle income taxpayers. High income taxpayers would likewise not see very much benefit because they take this the itemized deductions and they would still be better off taking itemized deductions even with a larger standard deduction. So increasing it, the standard deduction, that would bump some taxpayers into lower brackets and it would decrease the marginal tax rate on labor for them. And it would decrease the marginal tax rate on some business income too um, because, because pass-through businesses pay the individual income tax. But it could increase marginal tax rates on filers that would no longer be able to take itemized deductions. So again, we have these two um, competing effects on marginal tax rates, but in our estimates, um, the, the wash is a slightly positive economic effect overall. Um, but this gets back to, to what we talked about in week two when we're thinking about the effects of deductions versus credits and who benefits from those. Typically, um, tax credits and especially refundable tax credits are going to provide the, the biggest boost in after-tax income to lower income taxpayers because they already have such low taxable income that larger deductions um, are are not going to benefit them at all if, if they already don't have taxable income or they're only going to benefit them a small amount because they face low um, marginal tax rates. And so deducting say $1,000 at a 10% rate saves you less than deducting $1,000 at a 37% rate. 
that's faced by the top. And so with that, um, I'll, I'll pass it over to, I think Garrett's next, maybe Alex. That's right. Uh, thanks, Erica. We are going to chat a little bit about taxes and R&D. Uh, another, I think, timely topic given a lot of the discussion about research and development uh, in uh, the proposed American Jobs Plan, as well as over the past few years. Uh, and there's a confluence of reasons why this, this issue, I think, has gotten a lot more interest. Uh, one, of course, is rising international competition, uh, is particularly on the part of China, to try to compete with the U.S. Uh, in R&D. Uh, as well as, of course, uh, a, a sense that we need to be uh, rejuvenating our productivity and our dynamism as a country uh, in, uh, in, in the various sectors that engage in innovative activity. Alex mentioned a little bit about that in the context of manufacturing. Uh, and the one thing we know, to go back to what we talked about in the first couple of weeks, right, is that, yes, labor and capital are two major inputs into economic growth, but another major input is technological innovation, uh, that as measured by that, uh, that funky term known as total factor productivity. Uh, and what we've seen over the past 50 years from a 30,000 uh, foot point of view is that generally speaking, uh, that total factor productivity has been reducing and has been uh, lower in terms of its, uh, its net growth over uh, each, uh, each decade outside of a, uh, a quickening of the rate of innovation in the late 90s and early 2000s, corresponding largely to, of course, the adoption of computers and the internet uh, in a lot of business practices. Uh, not only ha has, has that been a long-term trend, but also we've seen a shift in the composition of R&D spending in the United States. Uh, so since about 1980, as you can see on this, this chart here, uh, private R&D as a share of the economy has grown pretty consistently. Uh, pro public sector R&D spending has declined over that time. And so we've seen about two thirds of all US R&D spending is now done by business. Uh, so there's some proposals, of course, to increase uh, public spending uh, on R&D in a variety of ways, including rejuvenating uh, uh, partnerships with uh, laboratories and universities, as well as other forms of spending on, on various government uh, research uh, institutions. Uh, but there's also, uh, I think, an important uh, part of the discussion when it comes to tax on how we treat private R&D spending, because that is going to remain a predominant form of R&D investment. Uh, and so there are two major areas that uh, my colleague Alex and I have, have researched in the context of the tax code that uh, is worth uh, highlighting. One is uh, how cost recovery inter interacts with R&D. Uh, historically speaking, since about 1954, for the most part, R&D has... Uh, been able to enjoy a uh, relatively quick cost recovery all the way up to full expensing for the most part. This is consistent with the way other countries treat R&D, where you get a full and immediate uh, deduction for qualifying R&D expenses. Some countries, of course, go even further and provide what are known as super deductions or effectively a deduction beyond 100% for the given cost uh, to incentivize that kind of activity. Uh, and of course, since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, R&D has qualified for that full and immediate expensing as well. Unfortunately, starting next year, as part of the, the broader base broadening of the TCJA to help keep the total cost down, R&D expenses are going to begin uh, to be amortized over five years, meaning you have to recover those costs incrementally over five years. There are even situ some situations in which R&D costs will actually have to be amortized even further out. And so, uh, as Alex sort of described in the in the context of manufacturing, that is a uh, an area of concern because that could post an unnecessary headwind to R and D uh, investments because you are raising the cost of that investment by both inflation and and the time value of money or the normal return on investment. Uh, and in a minute, I'll go through uh, what the uh, our modeling and the uh, our estimates of what the benefit of canceling that amortization may look like. Uh, so that, that's an important topic that uh, might get some play uh, this year in, in policy discussions as it relates to R&D. The second major provision in the code that, of course, uh, is helping to incentivize R&D activity is the R&D tax credit. And uh, the, as you can see on this, this first table here, uh, there's actually not one credit. There are at least four that all have different rules, uh, different, slightly different uh, tax bases uh, and different goals. For example, there's a specific credit for energy research. There's a credit targeted at collaboration between universities and the private sector, which has been an historically an important source uh, for uh, innovation in the United States. Uh, there's also a specific credit for uh, that's simplified for smaller businesses. 
But the big picture issue is that these credits are often very complicated to, to actually claim for uh, organizations that are conducting R&D, uh, especially for smaller firms. Uh, di it is disproportionately claimed by larger firms that are, for the most part, of course, conducting a lot of the R&D activity. But even when you control for that, there still seems to be some challenge with access. And a big part of that is uh, the complication related to claiming it. Often, firms will have to either uh, hire or outsource auditors and teams of interviewers to go in and determine uh, what can be claimed as it relates to this credit uh, for the, uh, the research that's being done. Uh, of course, the researchers themselves are not tax experts, so you have to have collaboration there that might divert folks from uh, the activity that they're engaging in that would be uh, more productive. And so uh, there is opportunity to simplify this credit uh, to uh, ensure that there is access uh, more broadly to, to smaller firms that may uh, be drivers of innovation moving forward. We especially see this because there's a, in a lot of the, the academic literature, there's a pretty a, a big and growing gap between firms that are on the leading edge of technology and firms that are sort of falling behind. And so we really do want to make sure those firms that are on the leading edge that could be smaller are able to claim this credit. And if they are sensitive to it, uh, can access it uh, in, in a way that makes sense. And then, of course, we want to make sure in the broader scheme of things, we have a, a more competitive and, and neutral system of taxation, uh, which is also, I think, an important uh, driver of innovation, um, as well, of course, as a, as a stable tax code, which I think is very much underrated in a, in a time where we see the tax policy changing all the time. And this is true for businesses and individuals. Um, and it is also important from a, a, a predictability perspective when it comes to investment. So with some of those uh, big picture uh, ideas out of the way. Here's some thoughts on a couple of different options to uh, incentivize greater R&D uh, moving forward. Uh, on the right here uh, is canceling that amortization that I spoke of. We estimate that it would raise long-run growth by about a tenth of a percentage, uh, percentage point, though I think that is a conservative estimate because this is not capturing the uh, potential upside benefit of additional innovation. So if we do uh, engage in, say, uh, long-run research on vaccine development in this thing called mRNA, uh, an mRNA platform that uh, takes 10 years to figure out, and a lot of folks are skeptical of it. All of a sudden, it might be really valuable if, say, a uh, novel coronavirus shows up. Uh, and so, it's uh, of course, it's, it's hard in, in, in tax policy, uh, sometimes even impossible, to connect any one given innovation or case study to the underlying policy. But we do know in aggregate that does have an impact and so uh, this is, I think, a pretty straightforward change that would, that would help with that. It does come with some revenue costs, of course, about 130 billion over 10. Though, as you'll notice, uh, and this is true of a lot of cost recovery uh, options, uh, the, the cost of this change is front-loaded, meaning uh, the first five years, it's a bit more expensive uh, to do. And that's because you are providing this full recovery, both for existing investments that have been made and new investments. Uh, but after the first five years or so, you start dropping off into a steady state, and we estimate it's somewhere between five and six billion a year, uh, indexed for, you know, for, give or take for inflation and the size of the economy. Uh, but overall, that, that may be a trade-off worth making because, of course, a lot of this is a timing effect of when you're taking this deduction. Uh, and overall, of course, we find that it, it would raise after-tax incomes across the board. Again, probably a conservative estimate to whatever extent we think there's a, public, uh, a positive spillover to innovative activity that we want to incentivize. And again, the, the great thing about this is it, it, it's with, it also makes sure that the tax code is neutral. So it's not a, a more generous subsidy. It's not something like a patent box that a lot of other countries uh, provide, which is basically a very large tax, uh, tax break for stationing IP into a country. Those have much more uh, mixed uh, impacts in the literature, but something like co full cost recovery is a, a much more straightforward way to ensure we have those incentives in place. Um, and finally, I uh, just wanted to show an option of just what the impact of lowering rates would be. Uh, not, not because it's specific to R&D, but it also it's just a reminder that uh, we do want to ensure that we do have uh, the correct tax base, a broad base with lower rates, as we talked about in the first couple of weeks, uh, because that it can be a strong driver of economic growth uh, and innovative activity. That's especially true, and we tend to see this in our modeling on taxes uh, on firms. So in this case, it's the corporate tax, which we tend to find has a pretty strong, uh, if you're raising it, a strong uh, economic uh, impact on the incentive to invest. We find that, for example, lowering the rate to 15% could raise uh, the long run growth by about a half a, half a percent, uh, though it would, of course, cost revenue. We estimate that'd be about $980 billion over 10. 
And so there may be other options, of course, to broaden that corporate tax base, to eliminate expenditures, uh, to minimize the, the, the revenue impact while also ensuring that we have competitive tax rates uh, that can uh, provide uh, that incentive for, for investment and innovation. So with that in mind, I wanted to turn it over to, uh, to Alex to uh, wrap up our final topic on taxes and climate change. Great. So I think there are, the, so climate change, obviously a big issue for, for this Congress and for the country and the world. Um, and so it's the, the first place where people start for climate change, or maybe not people, economists. Economists would probably start with a carbon tax that uh, when you have externalities, uh, negative externalities like those that come with uh, pollution, I guess both in terms of, of those are direct health costs of pollution, as well as the impact on the climate and the long-term costs of, of climate change. Um, and economists would say that the, the ideal way to deal with this problem is to place a tax on this uh, externality uh, based on the, the social cost of, of, whatever, of whatever this activity is. Um, and so that's the, the argument for a carbon tax. Um, but I think there, there are also ways that other tax policies related to investment in green energy uh, should be thought of, uh, uh, should be considered and, and approved. Um, cost recovery here, and for, for very similar reasons as manufacturing uh, is, the, the cost recovery provisions interact uh, very sort of un, unfortunately with uh, uh, investment in more efficient technology. Um, this is because uh, if you think of, of improvements that let's say you want to make some investment in uh, better lighting better light like like led lights instead of old old you know uh, um, uh, incandescent lights i guess this is probably a dated example but um that essentially when you move to a more efficient energy technology you have a bigger upfront cost you are investing you're doing a big capital investment that is going to have to be depreciated and spread out but the exchange for you as a private business is that you are going to have less operating costs in future years. Um, but in the current system, uh, you will not be able to immediately deduct uh, the cost of that big capital investment at the beginning, but you, you are able to deduct operating costs immediately. You would be able to deduct the full value of the operating costs. As a result, the tax system favors implicitly uh, uh, sticking with the old technology that is less efficient because uh, 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 it favors higher operating costs and lower capital costs to the higher capital costs and lower um, operating costs that would come with more efficient energy investment or investments in more efficient energy, uh, more efficient like appliances and whatnot. Um, similarly, uh, when you have a cons when when as we've seen recently, um, the U.S. is already sort of moving towards more renewable energy sources uh, in terms of, in terms of the power in, in terms of power generation, um, and so the benefit of expensing is that essentially moving to expensing over what we currently have is beneficial uh, uh, to the the power sector in that it would sort of accelerate these trends that if the economy is already moving towards substituting, going from choosing between leaving this old coal plant or what, whatnot in activity or investing in a new either natural gas or, or solar, wind, et cetera, uh, plant, then uh, uh, allowing those plants to be expense, uh, allowing expense related there to be fully deductible would accelerate this kind of transition. It would just reduce the marginal cost of, of, of moving to the new technology. So it would just sort of accelerate these existing trends. Uh, and I think the third thing that has to do with, with cost recovery is actually housing. Um, going back to the 1986 tax reform, which um, is, is, is usually viewed in by sort of generally as a like, uh, a perfect, a, a great example of like what a, great things can happen with bipartisanship in, in Washington. But I think this is 
for on, on a pure policy level, um, there are a lot of problems the 1986 Tax Reform Act introduced. Uh, and the big one was uh, the change that I mentioned earlier about residential structures that uh, it extended the cost recovery for residential structures and disallowed versions of accelerated depreciation, which let companies deduct a larger portion of their expenses sooner. Um, so the, the, the problem here is that by default, so, so, so that change led to a increase in a, a, a created a bias in favor of investing in uh, uh, single family homes over apartment buildings because uh, um, uh, apartment buildings are sort of the bigger projects and to be done by, by cor more corporate driven, et cetera. Um, and uh, so this change um, is, is bad for the environment for a couple of reasons um, because number one, uh, just on a, the physical buildings themselves are, are energy efficient than um, standalone single family homes. And secondly, and this might be also more important, um, this would incent this incentivizes essentially urban sprawl that instead of, of investing in bigger, denser apartment buildings, um, people are more likely to spread out into the suburbs, which has implications for climate change because of commuting and, and all of the emissions that come from that. Um, I guess the third thing on energy policy is there are a ton of, of tax credits and other specific policies enacted to subsidize specific technologies, um, which, which uh, would, would be, uh, uh, even, even if, if there are, you know, ideally uh, you'd have a, a sort of broad, a broad, broadly neutral system that is just pro-investment and because of the way technology is moving, that means pro-green investment. Um, but there are also some interesting proposals to simplify them, condense them, um, that might be worth looking into. There's a bill from uh, Senator Wyden, um, which, which would condense a lot of these energy provisions. Um, but I guess on, also on that note, there are some talk about fossil fuel subsidies uh, in the tax code, and a lot of them uh, are not actually subsidies. They're sort of normal cost recovery provisions um, that are not like, you know, we'll give you something extra. They're not some extra benefit to fossil fuel. Um, a couple of them are, but the vast majority of them are not. Uh, so that is another thing related to energy and, and these issues. Um, so I guess I have a couple options uh, to go over related to this. So there's a carbon tax. Um, uh, it depends, uh, uh, determining what the like correct social cost of carbon is to set a carbon tax at is not the most like simple question. There's like very wide uh, economic, like among economists, there's a very wide disagreement about like what the right number is. It has to do with what discount rate you wanna use for future costs of, of climate change and such. Um, but this is the, we, we went with a $25, $25 uh, per ton uh, for the example. Um, as you can see, it would, uh, carbon tax would not be super uh, distortionary economically because it's mostly a tax on on consumption, which which ends up falling on on labor mostly. Um, conversely, uh, it would prompt it would be slightly regressive, although there are a lot of policies one could enact to uh, mitigate this, like using a revenue for sort of universal cash payments, um, or or some other uh, tax cut on on some other uh, tax that is 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 regressive, like a payroll tax cut or something. Um, so that's that's one approach. Uh, there's also um, instead of expensing, an alternative to expensing would be to adjust deductions for inflation and uh, some normal rate of return uh, over time, which would provide the same sort of economic uh, 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 benefit as expensing, but would would end up keeping the dep depreciation schedules technically the same, um, and providing that for structures um, would help enable uh, both investment in new buildings, which are more energy efficient than old buildings, uh, uh, as well as for the reasons I said before about single family versus multifamily homes, incentivizing sort of denser development. Um, and so um, there's some, the, uh, the, the, the growth relative to the uh, size of revenue for neutral cost recovery uh, looks a little, um, 
too too good to be true in this in this in this run. It, it, uh, uh, the reason for this is is because the revenue cost of neutral cost recovery is is spread out over time. That uh, uh, doing uh, uh, inflation adjusting and adjusting for for the time value of money uh, uh, for deductions instead of just doing full expensing uh, means that the economic benefits are are, are front loaded, but the costs are back loaded because you're going to have to be be inflation adjusting the deductions 39 years from now. Um, so that explains why uh, neutral cost looks so good under this 10 year budget window. Um, it's still a very good policy, but I'm just saying that that's that's what that's why it looks that good. Um, I think that I think that basically covers it. So short version: uh, investment is 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 generally good for dealing with climate change because then we can um, turn over the capital stock and move towards more efficient, um, both more efficient technology broadly as well as to more efficient energy sources. Thanks, Alex. And uh, I think that wraps up the, the major topics we wanted to ch chat about today. Just as a reminder, before we get to questions real quick is uh, feel free either in the Q&A here or in uh, subsequent correspondence with us to let us know what questions or topics you'd like to see in our next session. We're pretty open uh, to that. Uh, we wanna make sure to, to answer questions you might have uh, in that. Uh, we have a couple minutes uh, very quickly for, uh, for relevant questions. Um, uh, it, I, I think one sort of big picture, or, 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 and it's really partly a value sort of philosophical question, is about taxes and and uh, and, and supporting uh, social responsibility. Um, I'm sure my, my colleagues may have thoughts on that, but that's uh, I, I think the the big picture framing there is going back to our our point about uh, that I think I, I made a couple of sessions ago, which is. The tax policy is really about the values we want to instill, and the challenge is there's trade-offs amongst those values in, in the tax code. So, for example, if you define social responsibility, which is a pretty big topic, as say um, ensuring that we have uh, a uh, capturing the full cost of say carbon emissions, uh, if it uh, generates a cost in the form of climate change, uh, that's going to come at, at a trade-off, of course, of slightly slower growth, uh, having to figure out the distributional concern there. Uh, and of course, others, uh, if you think about it from the, the growth perspective in another context, uh, we may in some ways have a responsibility to ensure that we have a growing and dynamic economy for our, our own children and our, our, uh, our fellow people both here and around the world, right? And so, um, because that is a grower, uh, the, the driver of both prosperity and, um, and living conditions in the long run. And so uh, folks are gonna have disagreements, of course, about what that means and entails in the context of both public policy and tax policy and the, and the challenges, how do we weigh those in our democratic system? So uh, no easy or straightforward answer there, I think, but uh, it, there are probably better and, way, better and worse ways to get at whatever your goal is. And that, that's really the, the, the key uh, thing that we're trying to get at in this options guide is even if, you have, if we have different values or we rank values slightly differently, we can have a shared understanding of what the trade-offs are. And that's where you really have to start before you can even get to that discussion about how we rank these things. Um, so at least you know what you're trading off when you're thinking about tax policy changes. And I think we're right at the top of the hour. I didn't see any other uh, questions and a couple of requests for uh, topics next time. So I appreciate everyone for taking the time to talk today and uh, to, to listen to this fourth session and looking forward to seeing you in the next one uh, as we take your ideas uh, and, and requests for the to wrap up Tax Foundation University. So thank you, everyone. Have a great one.